Hey, I'm Dr. Veneman. I teach physiological psychology and I found out that a lot of my students in psychology classes have had no background in chemistry whatsoever. It makes it a little bit difficult for them to be able to understand some of the concepts that I cover in my class. So the area that we cover in my courses has to do with the brain. The brain's a wonderful thing. It is actually an organ that works on electrical activity. What makes it so difficult to study though is that we protect it very well. We house it inside a skull. So it's difficult to get at directly. We have to get indirect measures that we can measure through a skull into the brain. I haven't found many of my students want to volunteer for a study that I could actually break their head open and look at their skull, inside their skull directly. Okay, so I'm going to do a few demonstrations here that hopefully will help you understand the concepts that you need to know to understand how the brain would work if you've had absolutely no chemistry whatsoever. And the first thing that I need you to understand is that there are a lot of things in the world that you can't see, but they're still very active. Can you see that okay? Okay, so you can see that there is actually a fluid in this bulb and nothing in that bulb. Correct? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so there are actually things in that bulb that we can't see, and they happen to be so small that you can't see them. But I can have an impact on them nonetheless. So if you notice, when I held the bulb on the left, all the fluid moved to the right. If I hold the bulb on the right, all the fluid moves to the left. And that's because what I've done, I've taken the molecules that are gas, and you have to just trust me that they're there, and I've sped them up so that they would push that liquid into the other bulb. So now I'm going to go do a few demonstrations to have you actually believe me that there's something in this bulb, that it wasn't just magic. Okay? All right. So I want you to believe that everything in the world is in constant motion. So I've put this on so that that will just remind you that everything in the world is in constant motion. If it wasn't, we would be at absolute zero and we'd all be dead but you don't have to know that for a psychology course. That is some other science courses that you might take. So you really have to get down this concept of the world is made out of small particles that are in constant motion. And I will do this demonstration, we'll just kind of leave it sit for a while. But if there was no motion in the water molecules here in my beaker, and I place a drop of dye on top, it should just sit there. As you can see, it doesn't. It falls to the bottom. Part of the reason it falls to the bottom is because it's more dense than the water I just dropped it into. But I'm not going to stir that. We're going to see what happens to that over time. So everything in the world is in constant motion. So if we were to actually take a look at this demonstration, the beads are like molecules. They would constantly be moving. Can you see that okay? Okay. Constantly moving. So they're running into each other. They're running into other molecules that are not like them. And they're also hitting the side of this container. So the same thing is true in the world that we live in. We have molecules that are constantly bombarding us. And actually, we are constantly moving ourselves. Our skin is made out of molecules molecular motion, everything is moving, it's bouncing against each other. So a lot of the pictures that you're going to see in your textbooks are very static and it's hard to understand that things are moving when it's on a piece of paper and it's static. So what we've got nowadays, we have CD-ROM. You throw it in your computer and you can go online and see a picture of how things happen in a neuron. But again, if you don't understand any of the chemistry involved, it doesn't really make sense why the little picture of the ions are moving if you don't understand the information behind that. So, in order to understand the information behind that, you just have to know the most basic chemistry. Really, really simple things. The first thing you have to understand is the concept of passive diffusion, which I started with the beaker of water here. So, passive diffusion is anything but passive. It's very active. It's molecules hitting one another, and so they'll have a tendency to bounce around. So, they go from an area of high concentration to low. Just like if somebody walks into the room that has really strong perfume on, they can start at one end of the room, but in a few minutes you can actually smell them all over the entire room. 
that perfume has bounced off them, bounced through the air, and it's gotten over to your nose. So, in order to understand a few of these concepts, we have to understand simple passive diffusion. Things go from an area of high concentration to lower. Things also move around in the environment due to two other principles that are uh, important to understand with neurons. And one is that charges, and maybe we need to kind of zoom in on this one. Opposites attract, so it's kind of like the dating advice you got, that you're supposed to date somebody that's not like you. I personally thought that was a bad idea. But opposites attract and likes repel. So if you look at the two little stirring bars here, they're magnets. They have a positive end that I have a little bar across to try to make it look like a plus. The other end is negative. So if I put the two positive ends together, what do they do? What did it do? It repelled, right? So what if I put opposite ends together, a positive towards the negative end of the other bar? What does that do? It attracts. So opposites attract and likes repel in terms of charges. First concept you have to understand and under, to understand why things are gonna move inside the neuron. The other thing that you have to understand is, all right, so we have all these molecules moving around in constant motion, but inside a neuron, we have to make sure that they move in an order that the neuron actually works and can able, be able to send a message. So we have to keep things on the right side of the membrane of the neuron. And that's done by another concept that has to do with polarity. So if we have the membrane of a neuron made out of something that charged particles can't pass through, we've basically made a little wall to keep the neuron separate from the spaces around it. So if you take a look at what I've just done, I've poured, this is just water, and I poured some oil on top. The water is representative of what's inside the neuron and also outside the neuron. So we're basically made out of water as humans and other animals too, but our membranes are basically made out of fat. They're made out of lipids. And so here's my lipid. If you can see, they don't mix with one another. And that's because likes dissolve likes. These are not alike, so they won't dissolve in each other. So the cell membrane won't dissolve in the water that makes up your body and it won't dissolve in the inner contents of the cell either. So it makes a nice little barrier for things to stay out of the cell or things to stay inside the cell, unless we want them to actually move. We can get things into the brain though, as long as we could get them through that cell membrane. So if we wanted to get something through the cell membrane, we would either have to open a door in the membrane, which happens very often, or we would have to find something that would dissolve in a membrane. So the key is likes dissolve likes. I'm going to do a little demo here just so you can see and understand the concept better. I'm going to pour something in here, and we're going to see which layer this dissolves in. So likes dissolve likes. It's going to dissolve in the layer that's most like itself. The fat's nonpolar, and the water is polar. So where did it end up dissolving? In the fat layer or the water layer? The water layer. The water layer. The water layer is polar, so I know the substance that I poured in there, if likes dissolve likes, is also polar. Now you know if you like balsamic vinegar, that you like a polar substance. All right? If I were to uh, mix this up really good, I could throw this on my salad. This is basically just Italian salad dressing. But anyway, you understand the concept, hopefully, that likes dissolve likes. If I want to design a drug, that's gonna go through the membrane of my neuron, I have to uh, actually come up with a drug that would dissolve through this particular layer, unless I wanna act on it outside the cell. Both things happen inside the brain. Okay, so we said that we're basically bathed in water, our cells, and there's water inside the cells. 
but it's not deionized water. So it's not actually pure water. What we find out with pure water, this is plugged into a plug over here off screen, we find out that actual water doesn't conduct any electricity. So that wouldn't be very helpful if we wanted to have electrical activity in our brain. We actually need something that will conduct electricity. But what we're really bathed in our cells is salt water. So it's actually the ions that are dissolved in the water that are able to make that current flow. So we're bathed in salt water inside our bodies. It's salt water, and it's really the ions that are going to conduct electricity in our brain that's going to be important in a second to send a message. Okay, so just to recap, we have molecules, constant motion inside the cell. We have ions inside the cell. We have ions outside the cell. If you take a look at a cell, here's a little cross-section of an axon of a large cell here, a neuron in the brain. So our cross-section here shows the inside of the neuron and the outside of the neuron. If you look at the outside of the neuron, it's basically bathed in salt water, which is just NaCl, sodium chloride. The inside of our neuron has some sodium chloride, it's got a larger concentration though of potassium chloride, and it's got these big anions. An anion is just a molecule that has a negative charge. So from what we've seen so far, we know that molecules are in constant motion, and if we take a look at our demo with diffusion, passive diffusion, we've got pretty much a dye going through that particular beaker at the moment because the molecules are bouncing everything around. We have the same thing happening in our brain right here. So all these molecules are bouncing around, the ions are bouncing around, everything is bouncing around, but they're all being kept separate by this neuronal membrane that's made out of fat. So we can see that the neuronal membrane that's made out of fat, which is nonpolar, would keep them apart because these have a positive charge, they're polar, they can't dissolve in that nonpolar membrane. So at the moment they're just all stuck on the sides where they are. But if for some reason we had a little gate that opened up in the neuron, then we could have charges start to move. If you look at my gate though, these big anions, they're too big to fit out the hole. So they're gonna be stuck on the inside. So if I have this net charge that's negative inside, back with our magnets again, opposites attract, what would be attracted to this negative charge inside? What kind of ion? Positive or negative? Positive, very good. <laughs> that was a very quiet answer. So the positive ones, so if we look here, what basically we have on the outside are positive sodiums, are negative chlorines, which one's gonna enter through that gate? The sodium's gonna enter through that gate, and it's exactly what happens. So we have sodium enter the neuron just because opposites are gonna attract, they're in constant motion, so they're able to get to the little gate that opens up. And another thing that would, uh, push them in is that they're in higher concentration here than lower concentration. It's just passive diffusion actually flowing them in. Then if we were to shut the gate again, which is what happens in the neuron, we'd have a higher concentration right here of a lot of sodium on the inside of the neuron that we normally did have on the outside. So the inside of our neuron then starts to become more positively charged. So if we opened a gate here, and the only thing that could go out that gate would be potassium, sodium doesn't go out that gate, the anions are too big to go out the gate, potassium is going to move to the outside because the outside has a slighter negative charge now than the inside. Remember, opposites attract. They're always in motion, so they're banging up against there so that they can move out the hole. By passive diffusion, there's less potassium on the outside too, so everything is pushing the potassium out, the negative charge on the outside is drawing the potassium out. So when you watch your video of the potassium and the sodium moving across the ion membrane, hopefully now when you look at those demos you'll have a little better understanding of why they're actually moving. And then to kind of clear this all up here, why do we care? We care because everything that you think or do or say or move has to do with your neurons fired in your brain. And we can take little pictures of that. This is a little picture of the electrical activity inside of a brain. 
and we can actually dis uh, discover what might be happening inside a brain. It's kind of difficult to interpret something that's a bunch of little lines, though, so we as science people, with computer people like the wonderful person making the video, have come up with ways to express that in something that's easier to understand, so you can change electrical activity into colors. So you can see where different parts of the brain are more or less active by changing our picture of electrical activity into a colored picture. And that allows people who study the brain to actually see what parts of the brain are active or what parts of the brain are not as active while we do different activities or perhaps have some different kind of disorders. And that's hopefully will help you a little bit understand the chemistry so that the demonstrations that you can get online of how a neuron works will make a little better sense for you.